All right, hello and welcome to Repro Action's first Act and Learn webinar. Uh, our topic today is how do we move from defense to offense? We are so excited you've decided to be part of this important discussion. Repro Action Act and Learn webinars are designed to provide a space for grassroots activists to share strategies with each other and learn more about important topics. Tonight is our first webinar ever, and we're going to start by taking a big picture view at the state of the reproductive movement. So let's get started with your hosts. We are the co-founders and co-directors of ReproAction. This is me, Erin Matson, on the phone, and I'm an organizer and a writer with a long history of activism for abortion rights and feminism and reproductive justice. I'm based in Arlington, Virginia, though I also have a Minnesota accent that I'm super proud of and will never let go of my Midwestern roots. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Pamela to introduce herself. Pamela? All right, Pamela, let's just see here. Uh, make sure you can hear me. Oh, great. Okay, so Pamela is calling back in right now. It sounds like her phone is uh, giving her an issue right now. So I'll just move ahead, and Pamela, when you get on the line, just let us know, and we can have you introduce yourself. Um, so first, let's take a quick look at the agenda. Um, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to introduce ReproAction as an organization. Then we're going to have a panel discussion. Our first panel is going to look at the current state of the movement. Then we're going to look at what we can do differently. Then we'll look at direct action and how we can use it. From there, we'll move forward with next steps. And then we'll do some space for Q&A with the panelists and or us, the Repro Action co-director. Um, feel free, and we encourage you to live tweet this if you'd like to. Just use Repro Action as the hashtag. And I think we got Pamela back. So, um, Pamela, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Great. Do you want to introduce yourself? I do. Boy, that was exciting. Um, so my name is Pamela Merritt, and obviously I'm technologically challenged today. Um, sorry about that, everybody. And uh, so I'm based in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, St. Louis uh, uh, raised since, uh, since I was a wee one. And... Um, I'm a longtime reproductive justice activist in the St. Louis community and nationally, and a writer as well as an activist. And I'm so excited to be a part of ReproAction. Awesome. Okay, back over to you, Erin. Great. Yeah, just the one thing we went through the agenda while you were dialing back in. So I'm going to skip to the next thing. Just one note. Um, we're asking everyone to please use the question chat. If you have questions, you can put them in at any point during the session today. Um, but we will get to all of them at the end or get to as many as we can at the end. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Pamela to introduce ReproAction. What is this new organization? <laughs> Thanks so much, Erin. So um, ReproAction is a new direct action group forming to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We are very proud of the fact that we are building our organization on a foundation of reproductive justice. Um, and we're also extremely proud of our left flank analysis. Um, we, we are expressing a willingness to hold folks on both sides, all sides, um, accountable. And that includes people who fall into the traditional column of allies, and then also people who might be traditionally 
identified as the opposition. We think that's very important because there needs to be a very clear uh, message sent to all people that reproductive justice is important and increasing access to abortion is absolutely key to, um, to ending and decreasing oppression. And then we're also committed to nonviolent direct action. We'll talk more about that later on in the webinar. Back to you, Erin. Great. So what Pamela just uh, explained, typically the reaction that we've been getting, A, is excitement. And then the next question we get is, okay, so what does success look like for you guys? And so we are very intentionally forming Repro Action as a grassroots bottom-up organization and not a top-down one. And I bring that up now because, you know, what does success look like? That's something that you all, that our activists and organizers are going to define for us together, that we're going to work out together. But for now, here's some things that Pamela and I have been thinking about a lot. First, that action will lead the way to accountability to the human rights and dignity of all people and cultural, political, and social change. This is a big one for us, that abortion will be accessible and funded for everyone, no strings attached, that there will be more clinics offering abortion care to people, that it will be easier to get an abortion, that restrictions will be repealed, that new policies will be put in place to make abortion truly accessible to everyone. Another thing that we think success might look like is the debate moving to uh, dignity and human rights and away from a frame of naughty sexual behavior or something that we're supposed to be ashamed of. We envision a world where people start embracing abortion as basic health care and something that must be available to everyone as a precondition of equality and justice. We are very intentionally setting out from the beginning as a reproductive justice identified organization. That means that our organization isn't just about abortion. We hold as equally important the ability to be pregnant and have access to the healthcare and support that a person needs for a healthy, wanted pregnancy. We also hold as equally important the ability to raise families in safe and healthy communities free from violence. We also think that success is going to, the more successful we are, the more we can expect the broader reproductive rights movement to take increasingly principled positions, not compromise so much, which is something that, frankly, we're totally excited about. Uh, and with that, we'll pass it back to Pamela to start our first uh, panel discussion. Uh, thanks, Erin. So um, before we get to the panelists, we'll, we'll start just briefly to run through kind of what's the state of the movement right now. Um, and when Aaron and I were um, in discussions about forming Repro Action, we had a lot of discussions and a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings with activists from all over the country. And one of the key findings was um, that, that there's a lot of frustration, a lot of people express concern with the state of the, of the reproductive um, health care and reproductive rights movement. And um, to sum it all up, you know, we're, we're not winning. We're certainly losing a lot of, of ground every single year. Um, as this slide very clearly shows, in the last, in just the last four years, there's been 231 abortion restrictions enacted um, in the state. And in the first half of 2015, states enacted 51 new abortion restrictions. Um, but one of one of the other things, Erin, if you'll move to the other slide, um, is that more than half of U.S. women of reproductive age live in states that are hostile or extremely hostile to abortion rights. So a lot of us, a lot of people on this call have seen those statistics. And um, as Erin and I wrote in our op-ed in Rolling Stone, um, our movement is losing, <laughs> and we need to go ahead and, and, and accept that. That doesn't mean we have to lose, but currently our movement is losing because we act like losers who are truly deeply sorry, um, and, and we're apologizing for abortion. We're accepting the opposition's premise that the only way to fund, to fund abortion or, or to fund health care, rather, is to defund abortion. Um, we're celebrating compromises. And, um, and we need to uh, 
stand up for the dignity of, of, of women and all people, and particularly we need to stand up for abortion as health care. Um, so what the current state of the movement is, 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 is is really extremely hostile. It's code red. And um, we're not the only ones to sound the alarm, but we certainly want to make sure that we're the ones who are talking about a solution and how we can go from um, shift from applause for things that aren't worthy of applause to accountability and from electionitis and focusing on elections to direct action. Next slide. All right, so our first panelist um, is Amy Arambi, um, who is a reproductive justice advocate and repro action advisory council member from Austin, Texas. Amy, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I so wanted to say, oh, sorry, just thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, and I'm really excited to be a part of repro action. Fantastic. We're super excited to have you be a part of the organization. So my first question for you is, have we been on the offense or defense? And um, just to follow up on that, or if you could expound a little bit more about what is our opposition doing that our side is not? So I think, as we all know, our side has been definitely on the defense. Um, since Roe v. Wade was passed, I think we got a little not necessarily complacent, but we didn't implement the necessary policy structures and frameworks um, to ensure the rights. Um, in addition to that, I think that we also didn't use, uh, let's see, communication framework that the opposition has been using very successfully for decades that have kind of provided them with a foundation to be so successful in their um, implementing policies in, in this fight. Um, for example, the opposition has been, um, you know, creating this framework by using terms that resonate with the public. For instance, they've co-opted pro-life, they're the pro-life movement. They used partial birth abortion in order to pass laws or in order to, um, ban procedures that are sometimes the more medically sound option. I think that the fact that that they've been doing this for decades, using this communication strategy and been very successful at it, has really bolstered their policy um, strategies. And um, yeah. Narrow Pro-Choice America has this great graph that shows that the opposition has been enacting policy measures around the states since 1995. Um, and each year they've gone up, you know, until I think last year they passed 835 um, anti-abortion policies around the states. But if you look at the pro-choice side or, our, you know, our side, it shows that we've only been enacting measurements since about 2004. Um, and we've been definitely falling behind in that regard. So I think we're definitely on the defense. I think one of the things that the opposition is doing more successfully is using communications definitely more successfully. Their, fra their framework has been more compelling to the public and they're very organized. Um, for example, they have enacted, they've been able to enact trap laws um, around the country in the guise of medical safety um, when we know that trap laws are not actually creating safer spaces for women. They're closing down clinics and limiting access. They also have been able to enact sex and race selection bans in the guise of anti-sexism and anti-racist policies, which we all know that's not true as well. Um, additionally, there's a whole section on some of the policies that they try to enact that are, cla or that are framed as protecting women because women are the victims of abortion policies, and we all know that's not true as well. So I think that the way they frame the wording of their communication, their policies, has been very successful. Another thing that I think they do very well is they've created a model legislation handbook. Um, Americans United for Life has this handbook on their website that's available to anyone who can download it. 
and it basically has a list of, you know, tons of bills that can be taken around the country and proposed and eventually enacted in state legislatures. And what I noticed is that they they um, propose the bills regardless of whether or not they have support and they propose them year after year after year until eventually some people think they've already been law or they're so familiar with the concepts um, such as you know fetal heartbeat bans or um, you know so they they just propose them year after year after year until people are familiar with them and they inevitably pass that's one thing that our side is not doing very successfully. I think that the whole movement as a whole has been on the defensive that we haven't, we're starting to, we're starting to go on the offense, but I think that that's something that the opposition has been doing more successfully for decades now. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, again, if, if you have questions for Amy or any of our panelists, um, you simply drop them into the question portion of um, the GoToWebinar panel that's probably to the right hand side of your of your screen and we will be taking those questions at the end of the call. Amy, thank you so much for that perspective. Sure. So next up is um, the wonderful and always fantastic Sharice Scott. Sharice is unfortunately unable to join us, but she did provide us with um, some, some messaging and, and words that she wanted us to read to everybody on the call. Sharice Scott is founder and CEO of Sister Reach, and she's also a Repro Action Advisory Council member. Sharice is based in Memphis, Tennessee. 20 years later, and the RJ frame is still not truly folded into the way our allies and partners are attempting to do work, do the work. What is consistent is the watering down of the RJ frame. Um, it is crucial to think intersectionally or comprehensively. Where we do see more employment of young, seasoned women of color in the movement by white ally orgs, we don't see their leadership on behalf of their organizations because they are women of color. Organizing in the South presents new challenges because you are the minority, not just in race and gender, but ways of thinking. Cultural competency takes on a, another dimension, geography. As an activist who started my RJ work in Chicago and then came to Memphis, one thing that I had to learn quickly is that different areas of the country require different strategies, even when you're dealing with the same base. It is important that potential non-Southern allies partners and funders take that into consideration. Organizing takes longer, mobilization takes longer, and so does movement building. Sister Reach's con commitment to work against the grain despite the results demonstrates the type of consistency and commitment generally required to affect short and long-term change in the southern region. And I'll kick it over to Erin. Great. Thank you so much. And um, I really apologize. I have the door shut, but some of you may be aware that I have a dog that uh, is on a tear right now. So I apologize for him. <laughs> we'll bring him out against the opposition, I promise. Um, <laughs> so um, I just want to say thank you so much to... Uh, Amy and Sharice, who wasn't here for joining us, and um, I love that whole discussion. So now we want to move on to the next panel. We've taken a look at kind of where is the movement at right now, and we've identified that we're losing, that, um, that we're stuck in a reactive crouch, and we're letting the opposition define the terms of this debate and even define what the debate is about, and um, that the movement is deeply divided. Um, now we're going to focus on what we could do differently. And I put up this graphic on screen because one of the things that we could start with is less cheerleading and more action. For too long, our movement has been stuck between two sides and going nowhere or going backward. <laughs> um, you've got one side, the right, that's opposed to sex. I know. Good luck, right? 
Um, and that side thinks that men should be in charge, and they use bullying, intimidation, laws, lies, and terrorism to demonize abortion and make it hard to access. The other side, the left, for too long has been largely fixated on the short-term election cycle needs of the Democratic Party, which, let's be honest, says all the right things in the platform about reproductive rights, but then moves forward and supports anti-choice candidates around the country and its leaders vote against abortion funding nearly every single chance they get. At Repro Action, we call this electionitis. We see that our movement has been largely subordinated to the next election cycle. It's almost like we're infected with a disease that we're saying, hey, we, this next election is the most important thing, so we better be quiet. That the most important thing that everyone in our movement needs to do is elect one candidate because the other candidate says that rape is, almost seems to be saying that rape is a good thing because then you get a baby. Now, of course we want to stop bad guys from holding power because we know that they are doing terrible things to people around this country right now. But at the same time, this movement needs bigger goals. We need to think bigger. Should women be equal? Does everyone deserve dignity and justice? What can we do to make abortion more accessible? How can we make sure everyone has good prenatal care if they are pregnant? How does this uh, interact with police violence? How do we make sure that we say that ending police violence is a reproductive justice issue? Repro Action takes the position that it's time to move away from elections and the fear that now is not the right time that it's time to stop worrying about getting invited to the meetings with the important people who say they're sorry when they did the best they could and compromise away rights yet again. It's time for organizing and direct action. So let's take a look at what we can do differently. And I'm going to unmute our panelist, Jody Jacobson, who's our first panelist for this sec section. Jody is the president and editor in chief of RH Reality Check. She is my former boss and an astonishing individual and thinker. And Jody, I just want to leap right in with a question. Uh, can you hear me? Are you there, Jody? Can you hear, can, can you hear me? Oh, yes, you sound great. Great. Okay. Welcome, Jody. Um, so, Jody, I wanted to ask you we've reached a crisis in abortion access in the United States. In your view, what could or should activists do to turn this around? And where do you think we should be focusing our energy? Well, right on target, there goes my dog. <laughs> he agrees with you, Aaron. Uh, we need to be doing something differently. I think, you know, I think the answer is really all around us. Um, I think what you, what you outlined earlier is the problem of electionitis and the problem of continuing to depend on one party, which is pro-choice and name only. Would things be worse under the GOP? Yes. But are they great or good or better under the Democrats now? Not really. Let's remember that under this administration, we have this two-pack amendment, and we have Democratic senators like uh, Claire McCaskill saying it's really no problem to incorporate the two-pack amendment. We've had any number of different uh, layers of abortion exclusion from the ACA. Uh, and we've had all sorts of other problems where the administration has stood up for abortion rights, even where it is legally able to do so, like with the Helms Amendment, where it could be providing care, abortion care, to women in refugee situations. So we've relied on the Democrats. And what we've done is we've, the reason we rely on the Democrats is because we give them money to elect them. They proclaim that they're pro-choice, but when push comes to shove, they don't really stand up for women's rights and dignity. They continue to wring their hands about abortion. It's a hard decision. Uh, we don't like this thing or that thing. So we're not moving forward in all the goals that you outlined earlier because we are sticking to one party and not holding them accountable. And I think the answer lies in the kinds of efforts that other progressive groups are taking, like Black Lives Matters, like uh, other groups that have fought for other progressive goals, even taking on the Democrats. We can't any longer sit on our hands and wait for the Democrats to become actually pro-choice in action rather than just in words. 
Jody, that was awesome. So just a quick follow-up question. What do you think it would look like? What do you think would happen for our movement if we stopped relying on the Democrats so much, if we started taking them at their word? Well, I think, for one thing, it means calling Democrats out and holding them accountable, as you've already noted. I think another thing is that, you know, politicians care about two things. They care about money and they care about votes. And we have to find a way through direct action to start to mount a threat to their money or to their votes uh, by calling attention to the ways in which they are, in fact, not supporting women's dignity and women's rights. Um, you can't call yourself, you know, pro-choice. What does it really mean anymore to be a pro-choice politician? I think we need to ask ourselves that. And then I think we need to ask whether Democrats really are holding to that. And I would say that holding them accountable, not apologizing for them anymore, and making sure that we are putting on the line their electability if they are not doing the things that women need them to do today. Sing it, Jody. That was amazing. Everyone, um, feel free to put questions in the chat box, and I'm going to move along to our next panelist, Lily, if you could uh, please unmute yourself and join us. And Jody, I will put you back on mute. Uh, Lily is a uh, feminist, reproductive justice, and racial justice organizer located based out of Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, are you on right now, Lily? Hi, here I am. Hey, we're so excited you could join us. So Lily, I'm just going to dive right in. So I've been so pleased to know you over the years. And for those who don't, you're the kind of person who has taken the initiative to organize many things for abortion rights and reproductive justice. Recently, like your beards and repro rights, hashtag online campaign, and you also organized a huge Walk for Choice rally in D.C. You've done this work outside of organizational structures or the existing organizational structures up to this point. And I want you to talk a little bit about that. Like, why have you just taken action versus waiting for others to take action? And what have you learned in that process? Yeah, well, I think um, what Jody was saying about the Democrats not doing enough, that resonates with me because that's how I felt about um, the mainstream feminist organizations the white feminist organizations, how um, my needs and my cultural sensitivities around abortion rights were not addressed. So it didn't make sense for me. So if I wanted a place in this movement, I had to carve it on my own. And um, I had to take action. And that's kind of what you know we have to do with the Democrats. We have to do that in our own movement, too. We have to do the pushback from the outside into these mainstream organizations. So... If I, yeah, I mean, if I wanted to um, just, um, I guess, sit around and wait for um, these organizations to address these issues, I would <laughs> be a really old um, lady six feet under right now, and I, I mean, it would just be pointless. So um, I really feel like I had no choice. It was out of necessity. Well, thank you so much for the work that you have done. Um, so my next question for you, just pivoting a little bit. Do you see the movement apologizing too much for supporting abortion and reproductive health? And if you do, what do you think we can do to take the shame and the apologizing and the timidity out of advocacy works for abortion rights and reproductive justice? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we definitely are always apologizing. Like everyone said, we're on the defense and we have made abortion a, a dirty word and a dirty concept. And I think that a lot of the things that we have also not done is by trying to normalize abortion, I think a lot of the time we trivialize it and we make a lot of people who have had abortions and had complicated feelings around that feel almost like bad feminists for feeling that way. And so I think we do need to be a little more sensitive. I think that we, in our, I think, quest to um, to get onto the offense, maybe we forget that there are that these are real human beings who have to go through this procedure, and it's not always, you know, um, the simplest thing. And in our communities, you know, as a person of color, as a Middle Eastern woman, you know, it's not um, something that is, you know, it's not dealt with the same way as it is in in other communities. So. 
you know, so I think that we have to make sure that we kind of hold on to those sensitivities when we're when we're speaking about this. Otherwise, we're going to completely lose credibility with um, people we seek to touch and seek to improve their lives. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lily, for joining us. And again, if anyone has questions or comments uh, based on this session, this panel session, feel free to type them in the chat box and we'll get to as much as we can during Q&A at the end. So thank you, Lily. And now, um, now comes a very exciting panel session and I'm gonna flip it back to Pamela. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, so what is direct action and how could we use it? Um, direct action means that we take collective action to change our circumstances without handing our power to a middle person. Andrew Boyd wrote in Beautiful Trouble. Um, we've all seen some awesome examples of direct uh, action across the last several years, and certainly in the last year, from uh, direct action marches and, and protests for immigrant rights, to uh, actions for LGBT rights, to um, the, the current actions going on around um, Black Lives Matter all across the country and against police violence. We've seen people get in the streets in a lot of different and diverse ways. Soci social, economic, and political action taken by people themselves acting directly as by strike. Direct action is contrasted with indirect action such as an effort to get someone else to act in favor of one's group as by lobbying for enactment or a new law, or an effort by leaders to persuade opponents to agree to an acceptable settlement as by negotiation. Gene Sharp wrote in Sharp's Dictionary of Power and Struggle. So um, there's a very, very clear difference in, difference in contrast between direct action, um, which is uh, to make demands and indirect action, um, which is where you get into the, the culture of compromise and negotiation. Next slide. So um, our next panelist is Monica Simpson, who is the executive director of Sister Song in Atlanta, Georgia. Monica, are you on the line? I am, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, it really is an honor, and I'm just so thrilled to be in this conversation with so many rock stars. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So um, if you could tell us what was it like to do the Black Lives Matter and Say Her Name protest um, at Netroots Nation? Um, it was absolutely necessary, right? Um, I We are at a point you know, in this country where um, fear is the first, fear, violence, all of these different things are just controlling the emotions, the lives of so many people in this country, and in particular, black people in this country. And um, this was one of those conferences, it's considered one of the most progressive conferences in the country. And it was necessary at that moment with the most quote unquote, progressive people in the country to raise awareness, um, to call attention to the very important issues that are impacting our communities. Um, we had just experienced the death of Sandra Bland, and that's just after the death of so many other um, black and brown people, trans people um, in this country, and so it was absolutely necessary. Thank you for that. So, um, so could you just give a little background on what exactly um, y'all did, and then um, how it made you feel, and how others responded, and most importantly, but um, also like, what have you seen as the result of your direct action at Netroot? Sure. So, you know, I, we have to give so much love and respect to the organizers of Black Lives Matter. They have really set the tone, right, for how folks show up and giving folks the, you know, a platform to stand in their power on, right? And so we were pulled together by black people who attended Netroots, who have been connected to the Black Lives Matter movement, who care deeply about <laughs> their communities, about their issues. We came together 
and said, you know, we need to make a stand. We need to we need to take a stand and we need to make a statement um, that really calls attention to our issues. Um, and we need to make those who are running for the highest office in this country, um, we need to hear where they stand on this. Not a pre-recorded speech, not something that they've had someone write for them, not something they've had time to do research on. What is in your heart? Uh, but most importantly, what are you going to implement, right? Um, that will actually focus on the lives of the most marginalized in this country. So we gathered together, we decided to do um, the protest, we decided to focus the protest on Say Her Name because we were, again, right coming right off of the death of Sandra Bland. Um, and it was we were led by Patrice Colores, who was one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, as well as local organizers, um, and we we did we did it. <laughs> um, we yeah. interrupted the digital. Um, so uh, so platform. so just quick, just quickly, yeah. if you could just um, let us know kind of how what what do you think the result has been? Um, yeah, in, 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 of that protest. Um, I think that we have seen a shift in the conversation. I think that that moment has made all of these candidates have to reevaluate their platforms. They definitely are speaking differently. They are going to their team and asking the very important questions. And I think that we have definitely seen them move this move this issue to the center of their work. And for those who aren't, they're definitely feeling the fire of not doing so. Um, so I think that's what we've seen. We've seen the media pick up on this more. We've seen our issues being centered in the media um, around this time, too. So it definitely has shifted the narrative. It shifted the culture. And um, I think it was absolutely a success on our part. Um, I agree. And so thank you so much. Monica Simpson with Sister Song, thank you so much for joining the call. Absolutely. Next up, we have Genocide Gutierrez, and I apologize if I butchered your last name to the fact. Um, mm. Genocide is an LGBTQ and transgender immigrant rights activist from Los Angeles, California. Um, Genocide, thank you so much for joining our call. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, so let's jump right in. Tell us what it was like to heckle President Obama at the White House. Um, it was a very intense act, direct action that was intentional, and I am so honored to be part of the discussion and to bring, uh, you know, direct action to the front lines of activism, because I do believe that once we move into this direction, then we can start seeing change. And um, during the introduction. Um, let me see, Cherise mentioned that we have to think critically about intersectionality and start seeing how oppression affects our communities, right? So me as a trans woman of color, undocumented, I'm supposed to not have a voice. So I am going to the White House and facing the most powerful men on earth to bring an issue that is affecting you know, our community inside the detention centers and outside the detention centers, and that's undocumented LGBTQ people and uh, transgender women, period, right, because we're facing violence in, in different angles of society. So to me, that was very personal, and it was much needed. Got it. Thank you. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about um, what you did? and then how others responded and how it made you feel. Um, well, I was inside the White House and I went with a message. I wanted to raise my voice and basically come out of the shadows because I was demanding President Obama to release all LGBTQ people in detention centers and to stop the torture and the abuse that we are facing uh, or sisters are facing inside these centers and uh, to stop you know, to put an end to deportations. So to me, it was like, yes, being in that moment, like I've heard during the discussion here, the dignity term come up. And I think that's all I was fighting for, that dignity, right, that my own community kind of didn't 
embraced that and instead with their reaction by booing me um, with you know agreeing with Obama and then finally being escorted out to me they were like more um, taking my dignity and they were further dehumanizing the transgender community so that it was very heartbreaking got it um, and then what what do you feel Jennifer what do you feel the results been of your action at the White House um, well, um, I hope that it kind of creates momentum, especially as we are coming to the next political election in this country. I hope people get inspired as much as I've been inspired by speaking to my community and the struggles that we're facing, that we need to make these politicians accountable. We need to um, you know, go to spaces and say, like, this is issues that are affecting and affecting us now. Like Monica mentioned, that was part of Netroots and it was an amazing, brilliant direct action, well executed. Like mine, you could have like done things differently, but those are the kinds of um, you know planning that we have to work as a community who who are facing so many issues and affecting. So I hope that created a momentum for all the people to start um, interrupting and start uh, demanding that our issues are being heard and finding humane solutions. Got it. Well, Jenna, thank you so much for um, for your work and for offering uh, and your ability to be on the YouTube call tonight. Um, I'll kick it over to Erin next. Okay, great. Um, Thank you so much to our panelists. I don't know about the rest of you on this webinar, but I am feeling so inspired and ready to help push a total paradigm shift on uh, on our issues together. And uh, and bold action is possible. So now comes the big pitch of the night, right? Uh, we are organizers, and there is something we'd love for y'all to do. Um, would you be willing to host a version of this conversation in your community? That's our ask for tonight. And let me tell you a little more about why. So ReproAction has every intention of building and supporting grassroots local organizing efforts that use direct action to bring bold change that will increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. And we believe that the first step to this organizing is connection. So what we're asking you tonight is to think about taking leadership to host a conversation like this in your community. Now I want to be really clear, it doesn't have to be fancy and we're not asking you to or organize a panel discussion like what we're doing today. Um, rather we just want to provide you with some questions that you can use as a jumping off point and get people together in a circle to talk about you know, the state of reproductive access to reproductive health care in your community and start brainstorming how you might use direct action to improve it. Um, we'll send you an email after this webinar sometime yet this week to let you know um, to ask you this. And if you want to lead one, just reply yes. Please watch for that email, and we really hope to hear back from you. And with that, I will pass it to Pamela. Thanks so much, Erin. So um, we're really fired up about uh, having a couple of campaigns that you can already dive into now. Um, so to plug in to repro action campaigns, we encourage you to sign up for alerts at www.reproaction.org. <laughs> Current repro action campaigns are Bad Legacy. Um, you can find out more at badlegacy.org. Um, and Pre Bad Legacy is about um, President Obama. Op he has an opportunity in front of him um, to take executive action on the Helms Amendment. He's, uh, he is right now, currently, the president is about to leave behind a really horrible legacy, a bad legacy on abortion. And he can certainly take executive action on Helms and uh, extend access to abortion to, um, to women who who need it and who are currently being denied it um, inaccurately. Um, and then we have the Hey Pope Francis campaign, which um, as many of you know, Pope Francis has been seen by some as a progressive pope. He has made some pretty pretty good statements about the environment, about 
poverty and um, immigrant rights. He's also made some pretty atrocious statements about um, transgender people and um, uh, LGBT families, women in the clergy, and reproductive rights. So since Pope Francis will be traveling to the United States, in September, and, and he will be addressing a joint session of Congress, we thought it would be a good idea for all of us to be able to um, weigh in with the Pope and let him know kind of what we think um, of, he's doing right, what we'd like to see him do differently or better, and what we think he needs to weigh in on. Um, so you can send a message to Pope Francis at um, reproaction.org. There is a um, the campaign is live on the home page. Just click it and take action. We also encourage everybody to follow us on social media. On um, Facebook, we are ReproAction. Twitter, we are ReproAction. And on Instagram, we are also ReproAction. Um, so we look forward to seeing you on the Internet and in the street. And back to you, Erin. Okay, cool. One last housekeeping matter before we get to Q&A and discussion. Um, so our next webinar is going to be focused on Obama's and our Bad Legacy campaign. So we hope you'll join us on Tuesday, September 22nd. It'll be the same time, 7 to 8 Eastern time. Save the date. Um, and we really want to dig into this question with more detail. How should Obama be evaluated for his record on abortion? Many advocates remember how uh, just a few years ago, for the price of getting a budget through, he said, John, I'll give you D.C. abortion. And what he did was he took away D.C.'s right to spend its own money on Medicaid abortion funding. And um, there's been other examples where this president has really, quite frankly, left much to be desired in terms of his leadership on reproductive rights and justice issues. We know uh, that this president does act when pushed, um, and we are eager to help push him now so that we can get a change on him. So during this webinar, we'll really dive into it and talk about what is the Helms Amendment, which bars foreign funding for abortion from U.S. foreign aid, and how is that different from the Hyde Amendment or the global gag rule? What actions can we take to ensure Obama does the right thing now for rape victims in war zones? Because for six years, he hasn't, and he needs to step up. What's really happening behind the scenes with the administration and the Catholic bishop? It's time to have some real talk, so watch for that email, and um, we hope to see you next month. And now I'm going to pass it back to Pamela for Q&A. Thank you so much, Erin. So we've got some great questions. So thank you, everybody who was able to drop one in. If you have a question, you can drop it in on the control panel, which is probably on the right-hand side of your computer screen. Our first question is from Adrian, and the question was, what are some examples of proactive bills that RJ groups could put together in a toolkit to make available for legislators to introduce? That question might be for Amy. Amy, are you on the line? You know what? I think we lost Amy, Pamela. Okay. Um, so then I'll open it up to the rest of our panel. If, um, if Jody or Lily or anybody else would like to offer some suggestions there. Great. I'll unmute our panelists right now. case Jody wants to weigh in on that. Jody? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Could you repeat the question, Pamela? Of course. Is it? Of course. So the question is, what are some examples of proactive bills that RJ groups could put together in a toolkit to make available for legislators to introduce? Gotcha. Well, I don't know that we have a full um, cache of such bills at the, at the state level, at like others, you know, like the other side does. I do know, and, and there are others on this call that probably know better than I do, that um, there is, in fact, a bill that, uh, that I'm spacing the name out, but all above all, and many other groups and coalitions uh, uh, support it, which would, you know, reinstate funding for abortion care at the federal level. And I think some form of that kind of bill at the state level would be really effective and you know even if you lose in the short term 
using such a bill, working it, you know, really working it to get uh, to get supporters, and really moving it each legislative session could be a really effective strategy. Thank you, uh, Jody. Um, so, in the interest of time, we're going to move on to another question. Um, what do you think? It, uh, this is from Hillary. What do you think it would look like if abortion wasn't a political issue, um, and, and, and she adds, as though it were any other medical procedure? And I'm going to toss that question to Lily. Lily, if you'd like to weigh in on that. Yeah. Well, um, that's a good question. You know, um, abortion is is another medical procedure. Um, I can't imagine what the discourse would be like if that changed. That would obviously, I think that would definitely change everything. That would, you know, if we began to view abortion as health care and nothing else, that gives us a lot of power. That would mean that we effectively were able to win back the narrative because for the last 30 years, um, the anti-choice movement has successfully branded this as not healthcare, as quite the opposite. So I think that would be the goal: would be to be able to win that win that battle. Thank you so much, Lily. These are great questions. Again, if you have a question, drop it in, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, so this is from a, a question from Edith: um, Is votes are unimportant to legislators, and they are? How do we convince women to actually go to the polls and vote for pro-choice candidates? Women are not voting in large enough numbers to affect change, but there are enough potential votes for women to make change. Um, so, Edith, I'm actually going to jump in here, and then I'm going to open it up to the panelists. Um, but one thing I think is clear that we've seen in the 2008 and the 2012 election is that um, women, women actually did come in and vote. And, and particularly in statewide elections, um, you know, depending on the state and many of the states that have seen uh, this outbreak of, 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 of losing and restrictions, you've seen women showing up in, in really solid numbers. Um, and, and a lot of analysis that I've seen has shown that black women um, are key to, uh, to winning the presidential race. And, and, um, and the same can be said for other voting blocks. So I think the, the, the issue is accountability. And, and, I, and, you know, I could, if I had a dollar for every uh, pro-choice candidate uh, who suddenly lost their spine when they became um, a, a, an actually elected person, I, I'd be able to, um, to run a campaign. So, so basically, uh, I think there's an issue of accountability, and then there's also an issue of, uh, of making sure that folks are aware of, of where, you know, some of their favorite folks are lacking. Um, a good example would be our campaign on bad, le bad legacy. I know there's a lot of folks out there who are very fond of President Obama. Um, we are of the, of the opinion that that does not mean we cannot hold him accountable. And so it's important for us to make sure that people are aware of um, his lack of action on Helms and then give them an opportunity to help guide him back on the path to doing the right thing and advocating for, for women and, and girls. Um, did any of the other panelists want to weigh in on that question? Hearing no one, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, so from Serena, if you had to pinpoint them, what would you say are the short-term goals of repro action in the next three to six months? And I'm going to be really, really mean and kick that over to my co-conspirator, Erin. Oh, my gosh. As someone who could see the question, too, I saw that one coming from a mile away. <laughs> um, so... Uh, yeah, so in terms of our short-term goals, there are a number of things that we're working on. One is just getting this organization off the ground is, has been a huge undertaking. And so we want to uh, get the plane in the air, so to speak. Another thing that we aim to do immediately is to introduce a new culture of accountability within our movement and also introduce a new culture of direct action within our movement. Now, I want to be pretty clear. When we talk about a culture of direct action, we are absolutely here for every single person on this call and everyone you want to bring in 
who wants to take direct action through repro action. But we also know that there are many activists out there who may be affiliated with existing groups or other groups, and we welcome direct action wherever it comes. And so we're not trying, I just want to be clear that we're not trying to create a quote, fully branded experience for repro action. We are absolutely going to do this work, but we want to support other folks who are doing this work as well and help lift up, amplify uh, those efforts. Another piece that we're working on internally is uh, we are building out a strategic planning effort, a three to five year plan for the organization moving forward and big goals. And then the other thing, quite honestly, part of the reason why we're pushing on the bad legacy and Helms issue right away is if Obama doesn't act within the next, so oh, I'd say six months or so, it's likely to expect that nothing's going to happen because everyone knows that already um, the momentum is shifting in the news cycle to the next set of elections. And so this president needs to act now. And so that's something that we're going to be taking a hard look at. Um, and then just while I'm on the mic, Pamela, I want to let you know that actually the panelists are muted. So, um, and I, Got it. so if you want to call on someone, um, just say them by name and I will unmute them for you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, so another question, this is from a rather familiar name, um, of my good friend, Sharif in Atlanta. Hello, Sharif. I'm sorry. I can't hear your lovely voice. Um, Cherie wanted to um, wanted to know uh, should these conversations that you are asking folks to lead be with those who are connected already or folks who are not yet in the movement? I say both. So um, if if you know of people who are not in the movement, this is a tremendous opportunity to educate them about the state of of reproductive rights and reproductive justice in your community and also find out kind of where they stand. I've got to be honest, Cherie, some of the most amazing conversations I've had as an activist have been with people who are not connected to um, any current organization, some people who have not even gone out and taken action, but they are deeply, deeply committed to abortion rights and are deeply committed to um, to reproductive justice, a lot of people that I've talked to and Aaron has talked to uh, over the last several months have expressed a frustration um, with current opportunities. So we encourage you to reach out to people who aren't connected because and find out kind of why they're not, um, because we definitely want to um, make sure that that they're aware that there's there is a new space and there are opportunities for them to take action and also aware of what's going on. And then we also encourage you within your network of friends and fellow activists, those are also the you know folks who need to be in on this conversation. Um, we need to be mindful that everybody at these gatherings, these conversations that we're asking you to have, um, we want to, and we will help, we're going to definitely provide you with um, and the toolkit to help facilitate the conversation. But it, it, I, I'm going to be honest, you've got to balance the conversation between people who are able, who are of the movement, and people who aren't. And um, so that folks who aren't, haven't been, you know, haven't been knee deep in this for the last eight years, um, so that they can feel welcome. And they can feel like um, like they can, you know, ask those questions and, and get up to speed and not um, feel like they need to walk in with a women's studies major and eight years of experience. Um, so we're, that's one of the things that Erin uh, and I are particularly excited to uh, be uh, able to help with. And we definitely look forward to um, talking to you, Sharif, and other people about how to get these conversations started. All right. Um, so I think we have time for one more question, um, and then we're gonna we're gonna keep tight to the one hour limit. Um, so this is from Serena. Um, it's for those of us who live in states that are fairly friendly to our day, like Massachusetts and New York. What can we do to affect change in the rest of the country? Erin, um, would you like to take that one? Oh, I'm so glad because yes. Um, so first of all. Um, I, I really want to be clear that there is local work to be done everywhere. And um, sometimes we get 
caught up with this idea in our movement that, for example, we need to save Texas, um, which actually has sometimes been taken um, deeply offensively by activists who are working very hard on the ground in Texas and effectuating change in their communities. I know that's not what you said. Um, I'm just uh, throwing that out there for a point. In New York State, for instance, which is thought of as a, a place where abortion is safe, in fact, there's been a devil of a time with a women's equality agenda. There's a, a set of bills that they've been pushing uh, an economic agenda, and the only way that they've been able to move it forward has been to kick reproductive rights out of the package. So I just highlight that that there are there are bad actors that are supposedly our friends anywhere you go. Um, and so um, actually, what we'd most like people who would like to take action to do is to start locally, and there's room for improvement anywhere. But that said, if you have good folks in place where you can make change, we could stop playing defense and start putting positive, proactive policies in place. There's here where I live in Arlington, um, I've heard some folks talk about putting in place proactive zoning uh, legislation, so it's sort of an anti trap so that it encourages and makes uh, more possible and more hospitable. Uh, the opening of new clinics. So just want to throw that out there that there's work to do everywhere. The work is going to look different, not just from state to state, but from county to county. But together, we are all working towards the broader whole. Fantastic. So um, I believe that that is the conclusion of our first um, Act and Learn webinar. We want to thank everybody for joining us. Again, encourage people to sign up for our mailing list at reproaction.org. Repro you can reach out to me at Pamela at reproaction.org or Erin at reproaction.org via email. Um, we want to thank all of our panelists. Thank you so much for getting us fired up and inspiring us. And I'll pop it to Erin. Thank you.